Okay, so I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I thought I'm going to open by showing you this painting. This is a painting of uh, the ship that Christopher Columbus used to go and discover America. And I'm using this ship uh, taken from a, a colleague of mine, uh, David Roberts, because this demonstrates disruption to me in the following way. When he went to discover America, he wasn't going uh, there first. He was going thinking that he's going to go somewhere else. Do you know where he went? India, correct. But do you know why he was going to India? What was the purpose of his trip? This is a little less known. He was actually going, someone said it correctly, he was going to find spices. Because at the time, the value of a kilo of spices was much more than gold. Because people thought that spices are the way to preserve food. People thought that if you put spices on food, then the food gets preserved, and it's mostly because what spices do to food is they hide the taste of rotten food, so you don't know that it's actually not good. So people were thinking that India is the place to go and get the food, and he was on a mission to go get spices from the place that they thought they're all there, and in, the, in his process he also discovered a new land. Now, for 400 years, once this industry of spices was flourishing, uh, flourishing people were building better ships, better navigation systems. Everyone was trying to find ways to innovate in the domain of navigation in ships because this was the way the world worked. But 400 years later, someone invented a new thing, the ice house. The ice house was a way to basically insulate house, uh, ice inside the, the walls of a building. And in doing so, it could actually refrigerate food and keep it alive. 400 years after Columbus went to discover a way to preserve food, someone found a different way to preserve food. You bring ice from Canada or from Massachusetts to anywhere in Europe, you put it inside the walls of a building, and suddenly the building keeps it cool and you can keep food there. How many people you think from the industry of uh, spices, pres preservation of food, survived and made it into the other industry? Zero. It was a disruption that changed the entire industry. And ice houses were there for a few decades. This was the way to insulate uh, food. And then someone had the idea or the invention that actually can create ice boxes by on, on, on land. You didn't have to go to Canada and bring ice cubes. You can just do it your own place. And suddenly, kings could actually have an ice box in their palace. And they could have ice cream, which was a royal food, because no one else could have ice cream. And how many people do you think survived from the ice houses industry and made it into the ice box industry? Zero. And after a few years, we met the refrigerator, and now we can, everyone can make ice in their own home, and no one survived from the industry that made ice boxes, and you don't need the ice men to actually deliver ice. And every couple of years, we have this new change that disrupts everything. But the thing is, change starts somewhere. And I've been looking in the last couple of years in the place where those things happen, the place where changes occur in our head. Now, I didn't have to go far into 400 years ago, 600 years ago, to look at changes. I could actually look at things that happened in our lifetime. You all remember in your lifetime how phones used to be that big? They used to be this bulky machine that you had to carry with you, and they got smaller and smaller, and companies were spending a lot of time finding ways to make phone even smaller, so you can fit it in your pocket, and maybe have more memory to it, and maybe make it even more complex. But suddenly, if you just look at this trajectory, and you can imagine what's going to go next, you think that the next phone is going to be something like that a little thing that you put inside your hand. But no, one company had the idea to not just make a phone even more smaller, but actually to invent a new type of phone, a phone that looks differently and is much bigger than the previous phones, but it has a different functionality. This is the iPhone 4. And in fact, when this industry showed up, people started making bigger and bigger phones. This is the iPhone 5, the iPhone 6. So now we know that the iPhone 7 and 8 are just going to be a bigger version of that. And the iPhone 10 is going to look something like that. But no, that's not the case. We know there's going to be a new change. Someone's going to come up with a new way to make phones. And this someone is already alive, and his or her brain is already working and thinking somehow on a way to do that. And the question is, how does the brain look when you make this choice, when you kind of think outside the box? And somehow, what's interesting here is it's in our own head. We have the new thought sitting. It's just lying there not accessible to us, and at some point it emerges. The question is, can we access this thought? Can we see what's inside your head? So I looked at various people who make changes in their mind or make decisions and try to see how the brain looks when this change happens. And specifically, the one world that I was interested in beginning was the world of sports because of this particular story. This is a uh, picture of a guy called Ahmed Bradjo. He is the running back for the New York Giants. And he became famous in 2012 
in a pretty interesting case. Uh, Europe doesn't really like football as much as the US, but in the US this is the biggest sport, and the game of 2012 was probably the most interesting game ever, since and before. This was a, a battle between two identities of the US. It was a battle between the Giants, New York team, versus New, New England Patriots, which was a, a, a New Hampshire team, and those two teams resembled, it kind of symbolizes two different things. On the one, there was a, 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 the quarterback who was kind of a play ball, he married a supermodel, he had a, a child out of married, everything, everything about him symbolized kind of liber li liberty. And on the other thing, there was conservatism, there was a person who's uh, uh, married to his high school sweetheart who was religious, uh, he never did anything other than football. Those teams kind of were remarkable. And this game was watched by 166 million people. It was a, a the most watched game ever. Commercial cost $35 million for every 30 seconds. People couldn't afford to buy uh, hotel rooms in the city where it was held in Indianapolis, so they stayed in Chicago, 300 kilometers away, and took buses, because this was the cheapest thing. This was a remarkable game. And to make it even more interesting, the game was almost entirely tied. So one team scores, the other team scores, one team scores, the other team scores. It got to the point that we were one minute before the end of the game, and the New England Patriots is ahead by two points. The other one is behind, and the ball will be the Giants. So they're, they're the ones who are be behind, trailing behind. There's one minute of the game. And it's clear that if they just score a touchdown, they're going to be ahead. But the other team is going to have the ball for a little more, and they can maybe score a touchdown again. So whoever's going to get to score the last touchdown is going to win. So our team has the ball. They want to score a touchdown, and they want to waste as much time as possible. And what happens is the following. The quarterback of the team hands the ball to Bradshaw, who spent all his life training for one thing, get the ball and run as fast as you can all the way to the end zone. He hands him the ball, asks him to run, but he also screams at him, when you get to the end zone, don't score. Just wait a little bit before, so we're gonna be able to waste a little bit of time before we score the goal, because they wanna don't have the other team get the ball. And here's what happens. Bradshaw gets the ball, and that's the only thing that he's been trying to do all his life. He runs. And he hears something interesting, his own team screaming at him, stop, stop. You can see him running here, jumping, everything, gets to the boat, and he tries to stop, but he cannot. His brain doesn't do it, he has slow motion, you can see it again. Everyone is shocked by this thing. He is running, he tries to stop, but his brain just doesn't know how to do it. And his just brains makes him go further <laughs> and score a touchdown. They end up losing the game. The other team has enough time to win. This is an interesting moment. It's a moment where your brain spent all of its life training for one thing, and now you want to, in the last moment, make you change your mind. How would that work? So I've been interested in looking at uh, changing of mind for a while, and specifically, I've been looking at the brains of people when they're at this moment where a choice is being made, and try to see if you can separate the person in your mind that makes a decision from the other person who kind of leaves it, and see if you can look at the difference between them to the point that you can kind of intervene and maybe help you make a better choice. And the way we do that is first, we have to identify the fact that in your brain, there is more than one person who makes a choice. Now, this is hard to imagine because we all live life thinking that we're just who we are. We just think that whatever we do is 100% our choice. We don't really live life thinking that there's maybe other people in our head who compete for who we are. So there's many ways to demonstrate that, and here's why. Here's a, a study that was done in the 60s by a colleague of uh, mine, where he took people that are known as split-brain patients. Those are people whose brain is basically divided in half, the parts of the brain that are supposed to talk aren't talking. So this guy basically has one part of his brain separate from the other part of the brain. And he's asked to solve a puzzle, and when he's doing it with his left hand, he has no problem. The left hand speaks to the right side of the brain, where puzzle solving sits, so he can just do it easily. But when he's told to do the same thing with his right arm, he has trouble. Because the right arm speaks to the left side of the brain, there's no bridge to work between the two sides, so he's just unable to solve the puzzle. He just sits there, and he cannot solve the puzzle. And you can see that he just battles there. The other person there doesn't talk to the part who can solve the puzzle, and he just sits there and is at lost. And you can see that the other hand knows the answer, and he tries to help its friend. So now you can see visually how this guy has two people vying for dominance, alive, and when you actually let this guy play with both hands, you can actually see the competition happening. You can see the two hands fighting over this guy's personality, trying to solve the puzzle. One knows, one doesn't know. Now, this is a pretty mysterious case of people who, whose brains basically cut in half. But it's actually happening in your heads all the time. In any given choice you make, there's those two or three or more characters in your head, and they're kind of competing over who you are. One wins, or maybe they have an election, and one kind of gets the vote. And then you just speak in the voice of the person who wins, and you never know that there were other people in your head that tried to say something else. Creativity 
And being innovative is, in a way, listening to the other parts. The parts that know other answers and don't get to speak as much. And if you let them speak, you can actually get an answer. And here is a, a way that you can all experience this unique case. Because it turns out, in your own brains, there's a battle between the person who lives life at the moment, makes decisions, and the person who retrieves them or memorizes them. And we can know that because we did a study that shows how everyone in the audience here can at some point find themselves in a conflict between reality and your own previous decisions. We do it in the following way. We bring people to the lab and we say, you're going to play a simple game. In this game, we're going to show you two cards with two pictures, and we ask you to make a simple choice, the simplest you can imagine. Tell us who the guy on the left or the guy on the right is more attractive. That's it. You don't have to think hard. You just have to say which one you find more attractive. So a person would come and he sees those two pictures and he says, I think the card uh, with the person on the left, left is more attractive. And then the guy in the back, the guy who we hired to run the experiment, hands you the card with the picture you chose. And you have to explain to us why you picked that person. So you might say, I really like this guy's smile. We say, fantastic. Keep the card. Here is two new pictures, two different people. Make a choice. Mm, this time, I think the guy on the right is more attractive. We give you the card and you have to explain to us why you picked that person. For about one hour, we keep pulling new pictures, new pairs of pictures. We ask you to make a choice and then to explain why we chose this thing. This is what you think the experiment is about, but it's not. Because there's a trick here. And the trick is that the guy in the back, the guy who hands you the card, isn't just a regular guy. He's a magician that we hired. And in 10% of the trials, in very few trials, he uses sleight of hands to give you the card you didn't pick. So you pick the card on the right, he would give you the card on the left. And two inter interesting things happen. First, people never say, you know, I, there was a mistake. I asked for this one, and you gave me this one. They just don't know this. The person who made the choice sits there silently, where the person who actually lives in the present just explains the reality that happened. And the interesting thing that's happening afterwards is that people don't only not notice, they actually explain why what they got is what they wanted. So you ask for A, I give you B, and you explain why you wanted B all the time. And you never question that, because the person who lives the moment is the person who speaks on your behalf. And you just listen to yourself and believe that anything that happened was your choice. This can happen to any of you. And this means that we can now actually look at your brain inside and see, in a way, those two characters making a decision and maybe see how a choice gets eliminated or decided upon, and maybe kind of look at the moment that it changes and understand how you made a choice and maybe how you can change that. Here's the moment to look away if you didn't like the picture of the brain rotating because I'm going to show you how we, how we do that. We do it by looking at patients who undergo brain surgery. So I work with neurosurgeons. These people work with patients who have all kinds of brain disorders. And during those problems, the, the patient comes to the hospital, and they open his brain, and they look inside to see what the problem is. And what I would do is I would, I would skip to the next one. So you can, OK. You can, now you can look at, again at me. Uh, what we do is we piggyback on the surgery and we say to the patient, you know, you're going to be in a surgery. Someone's going to open your brain and look inside. You're going to be awake because they need to keep you awake to make sure that everything's OK. Do you mind letting, having me also put electrodes in your head, microphones that are very small, and look at the activity of individual brain cells, ask you questions, and use those microphones to actually see how a choice happens in your brain. We can actually see decisions being made. The patients are happy to participate. And this allows us to actually eavesdrop on the brain. So we basically do something like that. We zoom into the brain, and here's where I'm going to use the microphone to play the sound. Hopefully it's going to work. We zoom into the brain and we put microphones next to little cells and it sounds like that. What you hear in a second, can you hear that? This is the sound of one cell in this person's brain speaking. And once we find those cells, we can actually do something remarkable. We can have the patient maybe sit in bed and watch movies like this one and listen to the cells in their brain speaking while they watch those movies. What you can barely hear, hopefully you can hear that. This is the person's movies, what you see above is the movies that she's watching, and what you hear is the sound of one cell in her brain that speaks while she sees those movies. And you can see in a second that one cell called something very interesting. Every time this woman sees a Simpson, this cell in her brain starts speaking. This is the cell in her brain that codes the thought of the Simpson. And I'm saying thought and not such the visual, because we can actually go back to this woman afterwards and ask her to just close her eyes and imagine the things that she's seen earlier. So we ask her just to recall from her own brain the things that she's seen earlier. So she starts speaking, she says, well, I guess I've seen a, a movie about this and that. And at some point, she's going to remember the Simpson. Yeah. 
Now, when she's going to remember the Simpsons, we're going to actually see her memories in action without anything on the screen. But not only that, we're going to see it before she speaks, three seconds before. Okay, now I can go back. Which means now that A, we can see your thoughts in your head before you express them, but also we can see a decision. We can see what you're about to say three seconds before you know what you're going to say. Which means that we can do all kinds of fancy stuff, like play your choices against you. Or for instance, we can play a game like that, where we have a person uh, drive a car in the, in, a, in the room, and we look at their brain, and at some point, the car is going to hit an intersection, and the guy is going to have to make a choice whether to go left or right. But we look at his brain, and we see seconds before he even knows that he's going to make a choice, what he's going to choose. We know that when he gets to the intersection here, he's going to choose to go right. And this is when we knew and this is where he actually expresses that. And if we know the choice before you make it, we can even play your choice against you in the following way. We can bring people to the lab and say, now you're going to play a simple game of decision making. We're going to put a box in front of you. This is a mystery box. The box has two buttons, one on the left, one on the right. And we ask you to make a choice which one you want to press, the one on the left, the one on the right. At any point, you can make a decision. One thing, we're interested in how choices look in the brain. So when you make a choice, we're going to save the data from your brain and make sure that nothing actually uh, gets destroyed. So we can actually turn the lights on, on this box, looking like this, to indicate to you that we're saving data from your brain right now. And when the lights are on, you can't touch anything. This is how, we, this is how you know that we're saving the data. When it turns off, you can start another trial. So the button box is there, you press the button, turns on, you wait, it turns off, you press another bu the other button, and so on. For about half an hour, the patient sits there and presses buttons. But here's what actually really happens. Since I told you that you can have a gap of five seconds or three seconds before the moment a person decides in his brain, and the moment he actually presses that, we can tell the computer now not to wait five seconds for you to press the button, but actually turn the lights on as soon as we know. So what you experience is that every time you're going to press a button, the light turns on by itself. It looks like that. So what this woman gets to see now is a very interesting thing. She gets to experience the fact that her choices were made seconds before she knows them, and they actually get stopped by me before she gets to execute them. So we see the gap between the moments your brain decided and the moments you know about it, which means now that we can do the most interesting thing, which is teach you how to change your mind. We can actually know that if a choice is being made before and there's a little bit of gap, there maybe is free will, that made the decision five seconds before, but there also needs to be a little mechanism in your head that is vetoing things, right? The choice was made here. You know about it only here. What happens in between? In between, there's a different system that actually works there in parallel and tries to change its mind. We call it the free will not or the free want. And the question is, can I train your free want to be more alert, to be more active? Can I actually make you better in disrupting things? Maybe make you more creative by, by letting this other system be more active, the one that is supposed to stop things and make things go outside of the box. The reality is that we can do that in the following way. We can actually bring people to the lab and have them play a game that looks like that. We, we have them uh, hold a lever in their head and we tell them there's going to be a bunch of dots on the screen in front of you. The dots are going to kind of dance randomly. But at some point, you're going to notice that, it, that the dots have kind of a majority that goes to the left or to the right. So you have to quickly look at them and see where most of them go, left or right. And as you see that, you're going to have to move the lever to the left or to the right, where you think the, the most of them are, are. So for a few seconds, you see these dots, and you have to kind of move to the right or to the left. But we flash them for a very short period. So what happens is that most times, people just go left or right easily. But sometimes, they start going to the left and actually change their mind go to the right, or they start to move to the right and change their mind and go to the left. And as they do that, we can actually see what part of their brain is the part that comes up to life when you make this change. And we can see how change of mind looks in the brain. This is how, because we finally need to make you make a change of mind on your own without us introducing it, but still catch it. So this is how it's done. We catch those little moments in the center where you started going to the right and go to the left. And when we find them, we can actually look at the brain and see what part was governing this particular moment, the unusual moment where you changed your mind. Once we find that, we can actually train you by, by actually activating this part a lot more. How do we do that? In the following way. We take athletes, like this guy in this uh, example, we begin to the lab and we tell them, athletes, you're going to now go on the stationary bike, and you're going to cycle for as long as uh, we tell you to. So you're going to go on the bike, you're going to start cycling, we're going to make it harder and harder as, we, as you do, and we ask you one thing, don't ever stop until I tell you to. The guy says, no problem, start cycling. At some point, it gets harder, and he says, when are I going to stop? And we say, don't, don't stop, keep going. And the guy goes on and goes on, it looks like that. Here's how it kind of a movie of the guy. And at some point, after a while, they just break. 
And let's talk about their brain for a second. First, their brain said, cycle, and the legs complied. After a few minutes, the legs said, please stop, but the brain still said, continue. And after a few minutes, it really gets harder. The legs says, please stop, and the brain says, continue. At some point, the competition is so hard that the brain has to call its friend, the other character, and tell this other person, give up. This is the character that changes its mind. This is the one that kind of stops things. And if we can look at it, maybe we can also train this part to be more good, to be more good in, in doing these changes. The way we do it is we bring you back the day after as an athlete and we tell you, you know what, yesterday you cycled. At some point, you got to this moment where you broke and you just collapsed. Today, when you get to this moment, we're going to play a sound to you. We're going to see this part of your brain that's kind of active. We're going to play a sound that indicates that you're about to collapse. It doesn't matter if it happened after one mile or six miles or two miles, but we're going to tell you that you're about to collapse. And when you get to this moment, just stay one more minute in this state. And then we actually train this other person, the person who's usually silent, to speak up, to get better. So every day you get training on this other character hidden in your brain that normally doesn't speak. Turns out that when these athletes get this training, they do much better in everything else in life. And this is true for all of us. We all have a brain that's unique, and this brain has the ability to make decisions. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I am done, yes. Uh, to make decisions that are beyond the natural decisions. But there are different states that, we're, that uh, are better for this moment. But for all of us, it's different states. For some of us, it's better when we're hungry, for some when we're full. For some of us, it's better in the morning, for some in the evening. For some when we consult with others, for some when we are alone, for some close to the deadline, for some not. And the reality is that for each of you, you can find the best state if you don't get access to a machine that actually looks at your brain and helps you find your best moment to make changes. We can actually help you by selling just keep a diary, look at your brain as it progresses in the world, and see at what points your decisions were best for you. At what points the decisions you made were ones that you were most happy with. If you look at your brain through history for a long enough period, you're going to see that there's some kind of uh, average that is, that is the case. You see that you're just better in the morning, better in the evening, better after uh, six hours of sleep rather than eight hours of sleep. Once you know that, you can actually know how to activate this part of the brain that's less uh, vocal most of the time. And without all the machinery that requires still looking at your brain, you'll know that there's some state that you're just better at. And maybe those are the moments you should try to be disruptive and kind of think of new ideas. Thank you.